our housing market is turning the corner. The HDB resale price index has turned negative last year for 2013, the first time in eight years. The private property index has also fallen, the first time in seven quarters. All property analysts and developers are projecting a softening market ahead. They only defer on the speed of softening. In last year's MND COS, I suffered 40 COS cuts. This year, there were only 27. So clearly, our efforts to cool the housing market are producing results. Madam, I was going to say that even my eyeballs, my, my eye bags have shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> but at the washroom just now, I checked you. They have not. I must place on record my thanks to our fellow Singaporeans for your patience and understanding over the last three years. I thank members of this house, particularly GPC Chair, Engineer Li Bihua, for your many feedback and suggestions. Many of your ideas, I put them into practice. In previous COS sessions, we had to be hyperactive, and we made many big moves on housing. Ramped up BTS, uh, BTO flat construction program, raised the HDB and EC income ceilings, delaying the BTO pricing from resale market. We allow singles to buy new BTO flats. We built more HDB rental blocks. We step up government land sales for housing. We introduced property cooling measures. They were urgent. They were necessary. For this COS, we can maintain a calmer stance, taking a deliberate and targeted approach as we negotiate the turn. We must be mindful that as the market turns the corner, the way forward is not straightforward. As Sun Yan Zi cautioned in one of her songs, Xiang Zhuo, Xiang Yu, Xiang Xian Kan, turning left, turning right, or go forward, have a care, be hopeful, but don't be hasty. A few key data to help us appreciate how far we have come in the last three years. We launched over 77,000 BTO flats, 14,000 units were completed last year and handed over. This year, double, 28,000 completed units will be handed over. These decisive steps have helped many young families our top priority. In three years, we helped 80,000 households book their HDB flats. 60,000 of them were young families. 60,000. 10,000 enjoyed priority because they had kids or were expecting. 8,000 benefited from the new income ceilings. 800 are now staying in our rental flats while they wait for their keys. 250 will move into three gen flats the first batch in Yisun, Yisun South to be precise. These are significant numbers of beneficiaries from the new housing policies. Mr. Gan Thiam po and Engineer Li Bihua suggested that we lift the HDB and EC income ceilings immediately. I have no plan to do so immediately. But appeal and I will look into each individual case. We have helped many vulnerable families who cannot as yet afford home ownership. 5% of HDB flats, there's about 50,000 units are now available for public rental housing. Another 10,000 units are at different stages of construction. They will raise our proportion of rental flats to 6% of our total public housing stock. We broke new ground with helping the singles buy new HDB flats. 1,400 have benefited from this new policy. Many more, quite a few thousand, will benefit this year as we ramp up the supply of two-room BTO flats. Ms. Penny Lowe shared the wish list of singles, I heard them, including the suggestion that we extend the scheme to larger flats. I have no plan for such a change immediately. Given our limited resources, let me prioritize and give I think greater priorities to the married couples first. As the market is at a turning point, 
there are not surprisingly opposing views on the way forward. Developers are calling for early removal of the cooling measures. Many forum letters argue for the cooling measures to stay. As noted by Mr. Binakaran, the government's cooling measures have been necessary to ensure that prices move in line with our economic fundamentals. With prices still rising, though tepidly, in some market segments, it is premature to withdraw these measures. While we have retilted the balance between buyers and sellers, we are not yet at the optimal state. We will continue to watch the market closely. On the supply side, we are moderating both the BTO program and government land sales. Meanwhile, both buyers and sellers have to be realistic in their expectations. One evidence that the resale market is turning the corner is the declining trend in COV, cash over valuation. Nearly 40% of resale transactions last month were priced below valuation, a negative COV. In fact, the market has coined a new term, CUV, cash under valuation. Now, whether it is COV or CUV, the practice of bargaining based on this rather than the total price of the flat is an anomaly unique to our HDB resale market. How did it come about? Currently, most flat sellers would obtain a valuation report for their flats, which they then use as a base price and negotiate with buyers based on COV. Contrast this with practices in the private market. Negotiations there are rightly based on the recent transaction price and are typically carried out before the buyer's request for valuation. So Engineer Li Bihua has suggested that the HDB resale market follow the practice in the private housing market. I agree. With COVs now hitting zero or negative, now is a good time to make the adjustments. I've asked HDB to move on this. HDB will rationalize the process of price negotiations and restore the original intention of valuation, which is to help buyers get a housing loan. In parallel, HDB will publish daily, not monthly, daily, every day, prices of resale transactions as soon as they are registered. This way, buyers and sellers can refer to the latest market information during their negotiations. Negotiating based on price rather than COV will take some getting used to. However, it is a useful move for long-term market stability. Engineer Li Bihua, Mr. David Ong, Ms. Fu Miha, Professor Muhammad Faisha have all spoken on the housing needs of our seniors. Our priority is to help our elderly retire comfortably with security. With a large supply of new flats, their married children are now spinning off to their new flats. We meet many of them in the house-to-house -house visit. Big flat, oh, just two, just a couple you know, staying, staying by. Most seniors are happy to stay where they are, although some find it bigger than they need. But they are comforted that they are sitting on a valuable asset. Nearly 220,000 HDB flats are owned by Singaporeans aged 55 and above and with a mortgage fully paid up. 220,000 such units. This is more than 20% of the HDB stock. I think we should all reflect on this number and be proud of this achievement. Most seniors have strong family support and healthy savings. However, for some who want to convert part of their housing asset into cash, they have options. They can rent out a room, they can switch to a smaller flat, or they can take up our lease buyback option. In the last three years, 5,600 elderly households booked studio apartments. 5,600. Another 390 took up the lease buyback scheme. Since 2013, 70 
top up their CPF retirement accounts when they right size and you know, move into a smaller flat. They receive a silver housing bonus of up to $20,000 in cash. When we engaged the elderly in our Singapore conversation last year, we discussed, in fact, the low take-up rate of the lease buyback. Many told us that they want two things, age in place and also they want to have an asset which they can bequeath to the, to the family. And along the way, some suggested that we offer them reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages are loans taken up by the owner using his property as collateral and repaid with interest upon termination or upon death, typically from the sales proceeds. Like lease buyback, reverse mortgage is a form of equity release, what we call equity release, release the equity, that enables the owner to age in place while unlocking some of the equity. Reverse mortgage has actually been tried here before in the past by NTUC income, but it didn't quite take off. As our population ages, retirement adequacy and how equity release can help enhance it is indeed an important issue. I think we have to spend time thinking about this. We have had some experience now with silver housing bonus, with lease buyback, and now a better understanding of our seniors' preferences. It is timely to revisit reverse mortgage as an additional option for our seniors. My ministry has begun a serious study of this option. We hope to formulate a practical scheme for our elderly. Along the way, we will also see if the lease buyback scheme can be further improved, as suggested by some members here, to be extended to larger flat types. I think Engineer Lee Bihua, Professor Muhammad Faisal, Mr. David Ong suggested that just now. We will also study how we can make our options more readily available and easier to understand so that the elderly can make informed choices when they need to top, tap on their flat for retirement income. Ms. Fumiha noted the commercial success of the Hilford, but wondered if it would really become a good retirement village. I think the jury is still out. The success of such a development can only be seen several years later when it is completed and when residents have moved in. So meanwhile, URA is in no hurry to push out other sites until we are clear about the outcome. With 80% of Singaporeans living in HDB, our priority is to make sure that the vast majority of seniors can age in place in HDB towns with strong community and neighbourly support. We shall leave the market to cater to the high-income segment of our population. Engineer Li Bi Hua has reminded us that a home offers basic security for divorcees and their children. Mr. Sia Kemping spoke very passionately on the housing needs of vulnerable segments of our society, including divorcees, single parents, ex-convicts. He felt that many were victims of circumstances and deserving of society's support. Now that the market is stabilizing, both members suggested that we shift our priority to the vulnerable families. I agree. Yeah. Now that we have cleared the backlog for newlyweds, we have begun to focus on helping the vulnerable groups especially divorcees with children. So the IBEX won't go away. Last year, we reserved a 5% quota for divorcees or the widow with a young child applying for a two-room or three-room flat in a non-mature estate. So actually, they get priority. In fact, they get very uh, high priority. This has helped 60 such families get a flat. Numbers sound small because the applicants were also small in numbers, but almost everyone we were able to satisfy their needs. But if you come across cases in your MPS that similarly somehow you know, drop through the net, let me know, and we will take a look. We have also shortened the debarment period 
and 120 divorcees have gotten to buy a flat earlier as a result. Question is, what else can we do? I'm open to suggestions. This afternoon, we heard two suggestions. Engineer Lee Bihua suggested that we remove all forms of waiting periods for divorcees with children. Mr. Sia Kemping suggested that we get the local CDC's inputs when we evaluate an applicant's housing needs. We will study both suggestions. Meanwhile, we will continue to exercise flexibility and compassion whenever we, we receive worthy cases from members. Many have, in fact, been helped. Beyond housing, we also offer practical help to the lower income, particularly those who work hard to better their lives. Engineer Lee Bihua highlighted one specific group, the dispatch and delivery, delivery riders. You see, today, motorcyclists using HDB and URA car parks are charged a flat rate of 65 cents for either a day or a night session in, one, in the same car park. This is inexpensive, 65 cents, but those who use multiple car parks within the day, in a day, such as dispatch or delivery riders, may still chalk up considerable parking charges. And apparently they bear such costs and not their employers. I accept Engineer Lee Bi Hua's suggestion that we should revise the EPS parking rates for motorcycles and begin to charge on a per minute basis. In addition, we will introduce an enhanced season parking ticket that allows motorcyclists to park in all HDB and URA car parks for a flat monthly fee. Right now it's different. If you HDB car park, URA car parks, you pay different rates. We will make sure the monthly rate will remain affordable. HDB and URA will work out the details and they will implement them as soon as possible. As we rein in our property market, some Singaporeans have turned to investing in foreign properties. The government does not interfere with such investment decisions, but I do share the concerns of Mr. Sia Ken Ping and Mr. Liang Ying Hua. I echo their words of caution. Property markets move in cycles. And for foreign properties, there are additional risks and complexities because there are legal and regulatory frameworks governing the purchase and their financing agreements are all different from ours. And they may change suddenly when domestic politics push for a change in policies. So do go in with your eyes open. The Council for Estate Agency, CEA, will launch an online guide to provide some general tips to consumers who are thinking of buying a foreign property. Do read it, exercise due diligence, caution and good judgment before you invest. There are no sure wins in property investments, whether here in Singapore or overseas. CEA, CEA will also step up its efforts to regulate estate agents marketing overseas property developments here. Members of the public should report to CEA any marketing activities by unlicensed foreign estate agents so that we can investigate and we will take appropriate action. Mr. Lawrence Lien painted a dark scenario of housing prices spiralling downwards, not as a cyclical phenomenon, but as a permanent trend due to structural changes. He worried that the ageing of a population might cause such a scenario. The future is, of course, full of uncertainties and anything is possible. But we know that property prices are correlated with economic growth. If Singapore's economy were to decline permanently, all assets, including properties, will decline in value. And that is why it is so important to ensure that our economy remains dynamic and vibrant. And underpinning that must be a healthy population growth and a productive workforce. These were the critical issues that the Population White Paper highlighted and we discussed at length in this House. 
Our demographic challenges are serious, but we can overcome them. We have done well in the last 50 years, and we believe the best is yet to be. The key is to ensure that we have an honest and competent government that continues to plan ahead for the long-term interests of our people, and our people are solidly united behind the government. Then we can avoid such a dark scenario. Mr. Gerald Giam asked again in this House about HDB flats at the end of their 99-year lease and the role played by SIRS. Like all leasehold properties, HDB flats will revert to HDB upon expiry of their leases. HDB will in turn surrender the land to the state. Hence, everything else being equal, properties with shorter remaining leases should have lower value than those with longer remaining leases. Buyers of short remaining lease properties buy with such an understanding and price in such an outcome that upon expiry of a lease, the land will revert to the state. Before then, and where possible, we shall revitalize old estates through SIRS. But SIRS is selective and dependent on the potential for land intensification. SIRS also assumes that the government's finances are healthy to fund it. So in short, for as long as our economy is strong and our government competent and well supported by the people, we will have many options to address such challenges. In the last 50 years, we have housed a nation, but our public housing program is more than just providing a shelter. It's about forging relationships in our families and our communities. And it is these intangible aspects of HDB flat and HDB town that make it an endearing home. HDB estates provide a unique Singapore way of life which we all share as a people. Our housing policies must continue to enable those relationships. Beyond the hard infrastructure, it is the mutual care and support within the extended family that people most value, be it support for parenthood or care for the elderly. Mayor Teo Ho Pin has made a point convincingly I agree fully with his sentiments. Many young married couples want to live near their parents, especially after they have kids. Likewise, many elderly parents wish to live close to their children and grandchildren. The presence of family nearby is particularly reassuring and comforting for the elderly. We must do our best to meet such aspirations. It is not difficult in non-mature towns where we are still building new flats. It is more challenging in mature towns where the opportunity to build new flats is less. Nevertheless, I want to push the limits to enable extended families to live near one another. So I will study Dr. Teo's and Engineer Lee Bi Hua's suggestions and, and we will think out our own ideas as well. Ms. Panelo suggested that any enhanced scheme or greater priority given to those who wish to live close, closer to their elderly parents should not neglect the singles, the unmarried. Mr. Gan Thiam po felt that the BTO system could also be refined to better gauge and respond to demand. I will also bear these points in mind. Finally, some members commented on the housing difficulties faced by families with very complex social challenges. Some may have sold their flat, because the family broke up or because of poor financial management. Others are unable to afford their next flat because they do not have a steady job to qualify for a loan or a grant. And public rental may not be the best solution for those households, especially over the longer term. So what more can we do to help such families progress onto home ownership? How do we ensure that they will continue to sustain their home to ensure a good living environment for their children? Even as we continue to support marriages and families, 
and reward self-reliance, how can we, in housing, build a social compact that is more inclusive and provide greater support to divorcees and unmarried parents with kids? I intend to further engage Singaporeans on the relationships and values we hold dear as a society and how housing policies can, be, can better support them. Our Singapore conversation has demonstrated its usefulness and we will do similar engagements this year. Madam, I believe I've addressed almost all the comments raised by members, but a few outstanding ones on construction industry and state upgrading, they'll be addressed by my colleagues later on. Madam Chair, our housing market is turning the corner. There are dangers ahead of us as there will be surprises. The best strategy going forward is to focus on the basic values and work on the priorities. What are they? Get our young to marry and have babies, get extended families to live near one another, forge kampong spirit among neighbours, help vulnerable families to stand on their feet again, leave no one behind. In Singapore, if you work hard, you will earn yourself a brighter future. This is our promise and I will do my part. Since independence, the government has made the building of good, affordable homes a national priority. We bring home ownership within the reach of every citizen and his family. And over the years, HDB has produced increasingly better homes, upping our quality of life. Just last month, we marked the 50th anniversary of the Home Ownership for the People scheme. This is a major milestone on the journey launched by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, driven by his vision to make Singapore a nation of home owners. At the, at the pinnacle ceremony, <coughs> Mr. Lee recalled, and I quote, when I got HDB to launch the Home Ownership Scheme in 1964, there were many sceptics. We had little reserves then, Singapore was still in Malaysia, our future looked bleak. The post-war baby boom and the high unemployment added to our pressures. Our construction industry was low in skills and lacking in building management. Few believe a home-owning Singapore was possible against the odds through greed and determination we house the nation progressively and systematically." Unquote. Fifty years ago, we were an island of squatters and slums. Fifty years later, a third generation of Singaporeans is now embarking on their own home ownership journey. We inherited all this. I think it's our job to build on this. During our Singapore conversation last year, an overwhelming 97% of Singaporeans said yes when asked if home ownership was important to them. But while we can provide a solid foundation for Singaporeans to start a family, the Singaporean way of life is ultimately determined by ourselves. While we can build a flat, it truly becomes a home only when we put our hearts into it, taking pride in the ownership and sharing lives ups and downs as a family together. While we can build the most livable estates a community comes alive only when shared experiences forge strong bonds and a sense of rootedness grows out of shared memories and personal attachment to the estate. The last three years have been very busy and I want to thank the many officers in MND and especially HDB who have worked tirelessly to tackle the public housing situation. This year, I want to do more for the elderly, the vulnerable groups, and help extended families live near one another. We will push the limits, do our best, and we will try to realise some of the members' wish lists. Thank you.